everybody welcome namaskara welcome to another session of uh, our uh, photo sharing and uh, learning uh, today we have a very special guest with us uh, uh, raju ak uh, raju ak welcome he is a professional photographer from bengaluru raju ak was born and raised uh, in the software hub of india his uh, forefathers were from the warriors clan of maharashtra and uh, emigrated to bangalore generations back He now substitutes the weapons they held into a camera, and it is more of an inborn, uh, uh, inborn passion than a profession. To acquire a degree in wildlife and nature photography from the Federation of uh, International the, the Art Photographic, uh, Belgium, he gave up his uh, associate of chartered accountant and uh, associate of company secretary in spite of topping the Bangalore chapter. So he has won more than hundred national and uh, international awards. He was awarded uh, Nature Photographer of the Year by uh, FIP, which is uh, Federation of uh, Indian Photography. He is the second Indian to be awarded as a highly commended from the British Broadcasting Corporation (BBC). Uh, he has represented uh, the country as a cultural ambassador in uh, South America. He stood second in a nationwide car photography competition organized by uh, organized jointly by uh, Mercedes Benz and Better Photography. Uh, having photographed uh, in over twenty countries, he enjoys all genres of photography and is addicted to pure oxygen. Uh, Raju, uh, I, I know him personally since a few years, and he's. Uh, uh, the master of light, truly. So uh, his subject knowledge. uh his expertise in photography the way he looks at uh, uh his images uh, before he shoots he knows what his result has to be so that very few people have that vision and uh, raju tops the list so he is a, pro- a professional photographer uh, like i said and uh, um, he has been shooting for over well over 35 years uh, and i can document uh, that i recollect of and uh is working as a naturalist as well at a couple of uh, estates i will hand it over to raju to speak more about himself start off uh, the session welcome raju thank you so i take over yes please yes okay uh thank you thank you pavan for a nice introduction i don't know whether i really deserve it um so before i mean before i start talking let me just say that let's start with the slide show and i'll uh, talk as we go ahead but i just want to say two things one i've been photographing from 1979 and okay. up to 8 up to 92 i never photographed anything other than wildlife i was a hardcore wildlife photographer and typical to any wildlife photographer you will see that the moment we see a uh, an animal we lift our camera and we want to make pictures very seldom we pause to think that the animal we might be disturbing the animal i was a typical wildlife photographer that way up to i would say 2017 in 2017 when i started taking uh taking consultancy of uh, being a naturalist i started seeing the other side of photography other side of uh the welfare of animals it was like a coin and i was till now seeing only one side of the coin but when i when i as a naturalist started taking care it was my job 
to take care of the animals, to worry about them, to look into their safety, I, I had to see the other side of the, of the animals. And that sort of opened my eyes. Uh, it, brought, it brought a sort of guilt into me that all these years as photographer, I've just been worried about taking pictures. I never thought, well, we do think, I, I wouldn't say absolutely never thought, but then you never come to know of the stress the animals go through when you're actually photographing. For example, just to give you an example, uh, I don't know how many of you are from Bangalore. If you, <clears throat> if you say go to Hesargatta and you see a bird sitting there, let's say a short toad eagle is sitting there and you approach and you photograph or as you approach, the bird might fly away. It might go and sit somewhere. Now you see what happens as a naturalist. As a photographer, I'm going to chase it again. I'm going to chase it. I'm, I'm going to try to get close to the bird. But as a naturalist, I started seeing the other, other side of this activity. Now the bird was not sitting there for having fun. The bird was not sitting there because like me, who's having a morning, a Sunday morning uh, photography session just for the pleasure, the, the bird was not sitting there. The bird was sitting there for a purpose. And what was the purpose? The purpose was it was to see that it finds some food and it ate. And what did we do? We actually went and disturbed it. And it's not that, it's not like a human where, okay, uh, we go to a hotel, this hotel is not good, we go to another hotel. No, that doesn't happen in nature. They have to go and establish themselves because the moment a raptor flies, all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the preys are getting, getting into the hiding. And then he has to go, sit, wait, and then they start coming out slowly. And by that time, we approach again. And then he flies out. This started giving me guilt. And uh, <clears throat> many times, I didn't feel when I was in Walpare and I was looking after the welfare of the animals, I never felt like removing my camera and shooting because I used to think they are already under so much stress. And then I want to make pictures simply because I like it. And what am I doing? And it's, it's against, against my job. So many times I used to leave my camera behind or even if I had my camera, I would not pick it up because I was worried more about the animals. So many, many of the pictures now what you see, you would probably um, see them not to the highest quality because I would have used my phone to record whatever is happening. So with, with that, let me start my slideshow. Uh, 170 images, 80 species, nine short videos. They are not videos which are like documentaries. They are just short clips where a movement adds a lot more uh, meaning to the activity that's happening than a single image. So I have included some short images. Now, when I say Walpare, not many of them know. In fact, a few wonder. First question many of them ask is, where is Walpare? Now, to, I don't know whether you people can see my cursor. The Walpare is rounded in blue. The closest airport to Walpare is Coimbatore on the top and Kochi here. People don't prefer going to Kochi because they'll have to travel interstate. So they go to Coimbatore, come to Palachi. From here, you climb up to Walpare. And the best part about Walpare is when you climb up, there is no via route. So Walpare is your destination. So people coming to Walpare have to come to Walpare and nowhere else or a little further. That's all. It doesn't take you again further to somewhere, some other place. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, the traffic gets limited. That's one point. Next, when you are, when you are, when you are at Polachi and at the outskirts of Polachi, you start climbing. You start climbing and then you have 
the you have, you have the climb and then once you climb on the top is a plateau which is undulated and once because it's undulated it was best for the tea and the coffee the british recognized this ages back more than 200 years back and they paved a way to to go to valpare to grow coffee basically that's that's what it was done for later it changed over to tea so that is the beauty of valpare and uh, then i must tell you that if you see valpare here in red valpare is surrounded by uh, reserve forests and uh, sanctuaries you see that and what is valpare doing there valpare was basically a small town for the laborers of the tea to buy their needs that's all valpare was it never grew beyond that even to this day it can't grow because there are right outskirt of valpare are all private private lands of tea growers so the valpare valpare doesn't grow like that it grows vertical now it's growing vertical and it's 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 uh, bringing in a lot of tourist people let's say a laborer who had one small house in the uh, in, in in the town now has demolished the house and built a three story uh, house so he has a homestay so that is inviting a lot of people apart from that valpare today is also a driver's paradise people love to drive to valpare because there are 42 hairpin curves that takes you to valpare and the climb is such that at the base at polachi you are at 200 feet mean level and at the at the end that is when you reach the plateau you are at 1200 square uh, 1200 feet of uh, the climb so 1000 feet in about 35 40 kilometers with all this roads what you see is what valpare is about and not only it's a it's a paradise for drivers motorbikers like harley davidson a whole lot of people who come there just to enjoy the driving not only are the people who come up there to escape the heat of say um um coimbatore or this side uh, madurai and stuff like that it is also a photographer's paradise because valpare is just not about animals it's about the landscape anybody who enjoys landscape he is bound to enjoy this place not just the place not just reaching uh, valpare as you climb up you you see all this and you are bound to stop <coughs> bound to stop and take pictures and then along you also have plenty of wildlife nilgiri thar generally i think it is at the 25th uh, i think uh, i don't remember but they are all, always there nilgiri thar in the background is the uh, aliyar dam and it's not just one female or a sporadic one animal there's a herd there's a herd of four five and you see this is a male grimacing on the uh, Um, female and then as you leave one area and enter another area <coughs> you always get greeted by this god which is known as muneshwar i'm sure many of you would have heard muneshwar muneshwar is a god that accepts offerings so i always wonder that if they would offer which animal they would catch and offer i don't know because I, i don't think they would go and buy chicken and bring it because it's they'll have to travel for a long uh, time to get the chicken then to catch an animal so i always wonder you know secretly i wonder what animals were being sacrificed here when you reach the top when you reach the top and you have the undulated uh, the plateaus and because it's undulated it's best for tea because tea doesn't need stagnation of water it has to flow out so there is stagnation of uh, there is uh, undulated uh, this thing uh, terrain and water seeps down and flows out but the british 
I mean, like always, used their common sense. They didn't clear the whole thing. They left pockets of uh, forest where the animals could go in and rest, at least during the day. So you see, this is a patch of forest here. This is a patch of forest and uh, around it is the tea. Similarly, another place. <coughs> you see the rich forest here and there is tea. So during night times, the animals come out and then during the daytime, they enter the forest and they are there for the day and then they come out again. Now, when you, when you reach Valpare uh, and when you are on the top, you are bound to see spectacular landscape. And if you are a landscape photographer, I'll tell you, you will never stop shooting because it starts with the sunrise. You have the sunrise here and uh, as the sun rises, the mist, the mist, because you are on the top, the mist is a low level mist because you're already on the top. That's another uh, scene of uh, the Valpare. Valpare town is little to the right. We were just slightly outskirts. And then you zoom in, you have a picture. This is zoomed out. You zoom in, you have another composition. You'll enjoy your uh, <coughs> while, uh, landscape photography. This is another uh, landscape, probably from the topmost, uh, where you start going down to Alpare. This is an, at the topmost point where you cl climb. And then that's the topmost where you climb. And from there, it's only undulated like that. So that's the point here called Kavarkal. And the mist, as the mist, as the day progresses, the mist melts down and then you have these sporadic places, uh, sporadic land popping up. And it's a beautiful uh, scene for photography. And as the mist disappears during the day, you have these tea, tea expanses with velvety tones on the tea. Uh, it's, it's up to you to imagine a composition and keep shooting. One more such place. Another such place. I don't know how many of you have seen a tea flower. I just put this here because not many people, not many times you get to see a tea flower. They are pruned before they get into the flowering uh, stage because they want to maintain that height. Uh, this is a tea flower. And there are many places, like I said, the British cleared the place from Coimbatore upwards to uh, towards uh, Valpare to grow coffee. This was somewhere around 1825, 1830. But somehow the coffee did not work well business-wise. So they eventually around i think uh, 1875 1880 they started shunning coffee and started growing tea in fact to this day there are a lot of tea tea plants which are more than 120 years old uh, now this is a coffee plant and if there is anybody who has not seen the bloom of a coffee plant i'll tell you you should make you should list this down in your to do list because coffee belongs to a jasmine family. And uh, just like jasmine, when there is a bloom of uh, flowers in the coffee, the entire place starts smelling. So you could, you know, if you are in Bangalore, around in Karnataka, you could always go to Kurg, uh, Chikmangalur, that places which grow uh, coffee. And you just inquire when the bloom takes place and make sure this, this takes place somewhere in. Uh, uh, you know, the first rain, somewhere around April, I would say, April, May. <coughs> Just inquire, there might be local uh, variations. You will uh, see the bloom and you should smell it. You should just walk in those paths. And it's, it's beautiful. I love it. That's a close-up of uh, the coffee. And then as the day progresses well into afternoon and late afternoon, another drama unfolds where 
uh, nature plays a different scene. And as the sun starts going down, many of these pictures are shot on iPhone. So you might not find them very spick and span or very uh, less noise or you know those technical stuff. But this was there in the context of the thing. This is, I'm sure, is enough. This is another picture of iPhone where I shot it panoramically. This is the Aliar Dam, which is actually spelled, it is spelled Aliar, but pronounced, pronounced Aziar in Tamil. I don't know why they do that. <coughs> yeah. So when you talk Valpare, you are talking of a, man, a macaw called lion-tailed macaw. These are highly endangered species. They, they have been mentioned in the Red Book of the IUCN. They are protected by law. And these are arboreal macaws. That is, they are on the top. They are on the top of the tree. For whatever reason, in Valpare, they come down. They come down, they cross a couple of areas, they, they sometimes cross the town and then they climb up again and then you don't see them again, they are high, in, high up in the tree. So for what reason we don't know, they are taken to this. If you want to see a macaw, a lion-tailed macaw, and you have, if you want to photograph them eye level, this is the place. Now, these are protected and we sitting here in our you know comfortable chair we talk of conservation we say yes it should be protected and then we talk and talk have a nice lunch and go away but for people staying there it's a different scene people who go through the monkey business of these monkeys it's quite another story that is where the man animal conflict starts and that is where a naturalist comes in. Now, this is a male. He's, he's had his fill and he's sitting there and relaxing. But his, his troop, he, had, he, he was a pretty big male and he, I think, had about 80 numbers in his troop. His troop were a menace to every possible property. Anything that's suspended, they would, they would catch it and swing on it. This is a zip line. You see that? They would swing, they'd swing the zip line in the most unscientific way. And then even wires that were coming down to the bulbs, they would try and swing. Here you see the mother and, a, and, a, and her young one there. If by chance, if the bulb grows, it breaks and if, if it has a shock, it will have a bad shock. But the locals have to undergo all this and it's quite a different story. When we say conservation, conservation is more of a city topic. It's in, in reality, when we go out there, it's something else. People, people are fed up of these problems. They have to be addressed, of course. They have to be addressed. They are, I am not, I'm not saying that there are no responsible citizens out there. There are. But then, you know, they are constantly facing these things. <coughs> like I said, this was the male and he had his large uh, troop. And, and like I said, if you want to photograph LTM, lion-tailed macaque, it's Valpare. And in the background, you see, you see the uh, amount of photographers. And here they have shunned to be shy because they interact with humans so often that they are not really bothered about your presence. And here, many photographers trying out the latest technique of wildlife photography, which is photographing in wild, a wide angle. So they go close to the animal and that's, that seems to be the in thing now. Gone are the days when we used to uh, use 600mm uh, stay away so that we could blur the background. Today they want the background to be seen. That is the in things and that's what these people are doing. But because, because these are the animals are used to the human and probably there are a lot of tourists who, who feed these animals 
they are used to coming and putting their hands in the pocket till now i thought only wives had that right to put their hands in the pocket but then the, this this lady especially was especially friendly and she would love putting her hands in others pocket and here again the same lady the man is busy with his camera and she puts her see somehow she has learned that there is food in the pocket probably the tourist must have you know pulled out chocolates or something from the pocket and anyway uh, when you when you photograph this you are bound to see this there are many 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 uh, these squirrels the malabar squirrels are very different to those of you who have seen malabar squirrels in uh, bandipur and mudumalai they lack this coat here they lack this coat this coat here they are completely light brown and they lack this uh, bicolored coat but here it's a different different looking probably eventually they are going to declare it as a subspecies that we don't know but as of now it's same species and like i said when like i said there are those tree uh, the the tea gardens and there are pocket of a uh, thick forest where the animals went in to stay to spend their day so we whenever we used to go inside such forest it is so thick it is so thick that we actually had to take our pictures we don't know what's inside so as a precaution we used to take our pictures send it to the management and say these are the four people now going in because we don't know what happens inside i mean we are just expecting or just being a little thoughtful in saying that we are we are going inside four of us we go in and four of us we come out <clears throat> this guy was the local guy without their help we just get lost and he was the naturalist from there and me and uh, another st staff and like you expect you have millions of leeches all over the place and we had to take something called some some one of those tobacco powders put it on our shoes put it on our skin put it on our hands to see that we don't get leech bites in fact in even in spite of all that we we used to have many leech bite, bites and it's more than i would say one two years i one and a half years that i've gone after the lockdown of course before the lockdown and the marks are still there this is the snuff powder the moment you put the snuff powder for whatever reasons i, I don't know if there's somebody here who can tell me why the the tobacco powder immediately kills the leech See, it's dead. Not only leech, we had problems of tick. That is, that these are. There, I think there are about seventy-two. I had counted them. There are seventy-two tick bites. This is after one entry into the forest for about two, three hours and back. <coughs> But in the forest, when we enter the thick forest, that had its own wildlife. Of course. you had to be watchful because you don't know what what is gone inside there could be gars there could be panthers there could be uh, worse still bears or worse beyond that elephants there could there could be anywhere anything inside so we had to watch in fact there was once we went in and we went in we were all like talking and involved in our own uh, our own activity there we looking at uh, observation i mean uh, involved in our own observations and then at one point we just lifted our head and we saw about 20 gars standing not more than 10 feet from us they're all standing still and looking at us without a word we had to just walk away from there because the the undergrowth is so much that you don't get to see them so it's quite it's quite dangerous and you have to be extremely cautious but this is 
but inside there were this is a nilgiri langur uh, and there are a lot of fruiting trees inside this is enjoying the leech uh, the sorry what am i saying uh, the leechy fruit yeah uh, of course there are when you talk valpare there is the great hornbill one of the places where you can actually see them very close where you can photograph them the great hornbill again not a very good picture because this was shot under different conditions here again they they particularly come to eat this fruit this small fruit and it's so funny to see such a big bird pressing each fruit to choose which is whichever is ripe plucking it and eating it one small one small uh, fruit it would spend time on choosing the right one and eating it and uh, apart from the great hornbill there was also the malabar uh, grey hornbill in plenty and here you see it feeding its its uh, female here this is the nest here uh can can you see my cursor uh, pavan can you see my cursor yes sir yeah okay lovely okay uh, so this <coughs> the, the, the speciality about uh, these hornbills is that at at egg laying stage the female goes in and seals herself inside and leaves only one small slit so that she can put her mandibles and receive food uh and the male has to feed the female the, the female is completely helpless it is said it is said that it she even shreds her feathers and she is naked because she wants to save the space inside so if the if something happens to the male the female dies inside so it's a very crucial uh, um time <clears throat> so this is the male who is to uh, he is to bring a lot of uh, fruits one or two times in a, in a day he would bring a non vegetarian meal this is a calotis grandis it's the green uh, forest lizard and of course when you say valpare it has to be elephants elephants that are harassed that come calm that come i mean constantly in conflict with human the elephants say we have been here and the humans say now this is my land now who has to give up is a question that can't be answered it's a very common thing to see elephants coming into uh, the, the space the uh, the town close to peripheries and the people you know running into them having surprises there are a lot of conservation uh, uh, groups that track these elephant and announce uh, through sms or radio that elephant is in this area but in i mean to a large extent they have cut down deaths but still it happens i don't think it is something that can be brought down to zero because uh the elephants elephants are a reality there and people have to move about so we don't know when one just you know intersect and then there's a death this is a very common sight again uh, elephants in the t t estate here again just a different format now this this is a typical scene a vast expanse of tea garden ah excuse me <clears throat> a vast expanse of tea garden and an elephant standing there and eating now just imagine if this is in the night just imagine if this is happening in the night you can't see night meaning i am not talking of 1 o'clock 2 o'clock i am talking of 6:37 when it's dark when the sun has gone down the elephant is there and anybody walking there will not see the elephant unfortunately 
people like say night watchmen who are either coming into coming in for the duty or who have finished their day uh, duty and are going back <coughs> they encounter these situation the elephant is there and these people are walking and the elephant the moment they see a human they they stop eating and they freeze they freeze and when the when the person is too close there is something that 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 is when the encounter takes place in spite of being told many times that they have to go with a torch because if you switch on the torch at least it will go away it will not come towards you uh what happens is there is something called overconfidence because the person might think it didn't happen yesterday it didn't happen day before yesterday it not happened for past one month it's not happened from past one year what will happen to me and it just has to happen for once one night and next day morning you get a call saying that there's a death and then boom <coughs> every every possible bone would have got broken here is another one see that virtually the sc- skull is broken through these are very common things they just have to be a little respectful towards it it's it's exactly what is happening now uh, corona will not come to me so i'm not going to wear mask that's exactly it just has to happen once and look what it uh, what uh, the whole life comes to an end the latest trend about elephants <coughs> is when the elephant comes to a house smells grains inside breaks the wall and comes in this is a very bad trend that is picking up because eventually it will be the elephant's loss i mean i'm sure there will be something some drastic measures that will be taken place but when it starts getting into the house how do you protect yourself you just come ransack eat your uh, rice or whatever you kept vegetables and then leave <coughs> so this is about elephants of walpare another another animal when you are in walpare is panthers panthers probably what from what i have seen they are the large they have the largest density of panthers in walpare and there are so many of them that you see this guy he saw us and then he just went back to sleep he, he wasn't even bothered i've never seen i mean we are used to the bandipur kind of thing where it sees us and runs away this guy just saw us and went back to sleep so we were there we took a few shots we were we didn't know what to do then after some time he got up and started walking towards us virtually walking towards us and then halfway through he saw we were a lot of people he just stopped saw us he didn't want to come any further he jumped and went away so the, this is how the panthers are <clears throat> and you're bound to come across if you take a ride say in one or two days we would see a panther invariably this is a male sitting there and initially when we saw it we we would stop the jeep and we would like hide and look at it and uh, uh, photograph it and then leave then one day we saw that this guy is sitting there and we parked our jeep and in between us and the panther there are laborers working and they are not bothered this guy is not bothered so we realized that this this guy is not shy of human and eventually when we started seeing him he was a full grown a full grown huge male but his behavior was like a big pussy cat we used to see him often sitting like a, like a big pussy cat you know trying to hide and uh, it it was real fun this is the same guy again the same guy oh uh, it's gone it's it's see that i'm sorry it's gone uh, 
it's turned around. I don't know why, because I shot this on my iPhone. This panther was sitting here, and when we when we stopped and uh, saw, and then um, it just got up and started walking. Like I said, these are times where I don't want to disturb the panther. I didn't want to stop, but there were some guests, so I just stopped, and I didn't want to again, you know, shoot and look at that. He, he even urinates, telling us to piss off. And I took this on the iPhone. <clears throat> this was a shot by one of the guests who had come, one Gaurav Ram Narayan. Uh, that's his female. Uh, the previous one was the male, and that's his female, and uh, she had grown up young ones. So what she would do is she would go in for bigger preys so that uh, she could feed her. She could feed her. The youngsters would come and feed, and this was let's say we see this by about five thirty six. She has made a kill, and by morning it would be down to bones. There's nothing left there. So, which means it's not just one panther feeding. There were a couple of grown-up young ones who used to come and feed. But, like I said, we never bothered to go and sit. And it was very easy for us to go and sit and take pictures from a close-up, from a little closer view. But we did because we were bothered. We know as it is, you know, the panther is already under stress. And taking away its feed, that is, you go close and somebody sees you photographing and they come and then they see the buffalo. I've seen this happen. The locals chase the panther and claim the carcass. They, they cut the meat and take over. I've seen this happen. I don't know why they do that. Because once they take over the meat, then the panther has to kill again. So as it is, they have lost a buffalo, then they lose another buffalo. And I've seen this happen even in Nilgiris, uh, where I used to work uh, in another resort. I, uh, we saw a, pan a tiger kill a, um, a deer, sambar deer, and uh, we saw some commotion. So we went there. He had started to eat a little bit of the deer. So the guy who took me, he, he started. He saw the deer. He got excited. He started calling his. Uh, friends to claim to come over so that we could take the meat and I, I virtually had to stop him. I mean, I had to threaten him that if you don't do, if you do this, I'm going to report it to the management. I don't know why they do that. This, as we drive, we saw some commotion. We just put a torch and we see a panther sit there. Again, another day we just drive. I mean, this particular day we saw the panther. We saw three panthers. He saw the jeep light and he stood there. We didn't even put the torch. We just put our jeep uh, jeep light and took a few shots. Switched off the uh, jeep and just kept quiet. We 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 could in that little uh, moonlight we could see the panther come. He came about 25 meters from us. Then to to avoid our jeep, he went into the T estate and at the back he must have again come out into the road and walked. But we didn't want to disturb him. And of course, there are a lot of uh, herbivores, there's a lot of animal life and this was a huge sambar. He was so huge, I particularly put that person next to just show the size of this sambar. Probably he was an old guy and he didn't mind our presence at all. But within a few, I think within, I would say less than a month, we saw him, we saw his carcass and we were wondering what had killed it when we saw wild dogs with tummy full walking away. There were a few wild dogs, they would, they would do the killing. I mean, that's that's nature's thing. We shouldn't disturb that. Now we come to the... <coughs> I would say these were like cows and buffaloes of Valpare. Just that they are not. They are there all over. This is a mobile shot again. And he was eating. I stopped my jeep. He, started, he lifted his head to smell me. I took a shot and left. 
this again, this was shot by uh, the hospitality manager, manager who was a good photographer himself. He saw two bulls together, grown up bulls. I've never seen this. And this was another instance where we were going in the Jeep and we saw the uh, calf sucking. We went close. I took this on the on, on my mobile, and then we stood for some time. Uh, some time took our pictures and immediately left. I mean, if you if you if you approach your subject, shoot, and then leave without disturbing it, without the subject having mood, that is when you are a successful photographer. I would say, but if you go and you disturb it and you make your pictures and then move that's not worth it i feel by the time when we left the calf was still suckling so we don't have to feel guilty about having gone and shoot shot if the mother had moved away and the calf had moved away then the guilt would come in <coughs> there They were just all over the place. Now the trash that was thrown by uh, the resort, of course, they would, it would attract animals. One of them was this mongoose, the striped neck mongoose that came to uh, check the thrash. He would come during the day. He was not really, not a shy animal, but during the night, uh, you, I'm sorry about this big patch, but this is the this is the way we could shoot. You see the Indian small Indian civet here coming and uh, <coughs> checking the thrash. He would come there every day, and then the brown civet. I was very keen on shooting this because I I don't I didn't have this picture until I was in Valpare. And these these don't come to the thrash. We initially we we were searching for it all over, and we never found one. And then one day suddenly we found it, and then we found out that the brown civet actually feeds on coffee seeds, the coffee fruit. They come to the coffee estate at one particular time when the fruit is. At the verge of ripening, and they eat that fruit. <coughs> to eat that fruit, this civet would come. And of course, we all know the coffee luca, that is the, the, the civet that would eat the coffee and excrete, and they collect that seed. And I think it is sold at around thousand dollars a kilo. And uh, it's some sort of a luxury coffee, but I would never drink it. It's not my cup of coffee. Uh, we would see a lot of excretes uh, of civets with coffee seeds. This is the flying squirrel. Again, a nocturnal squirrel. And of course, they glide. They go, they go up and then they glide. They glide quite a distance. I've seen them glide about 50 meters. And that's the extra skin that they use to glide. And that's another picture. And of course you had those squirrels. I don't know what this guy is up to. If somebody can explain, I'll be happy. He was he virtually, he pulled the top skin back. I don't know what he did. That was painful even to photograph. <coughs> birds, of course, we had plenty of birds. I will just show a few. I think they recorded about uh, 80 species within our area. Uh, this is a grey heron. This is a bittern. Orioles. Just, add, just added a few uh, the woodpeckers. We had plenty of woodpeckers. And of course, the hero of our uh, Valpare is the Malabar whistling thrush. <coughs> By four o'clock in the morning, they start whistling. Just listen to this. Oh, I don't know when. 
this is lost it. Let me see if I can find the audio. Or probably this uh, software doesn't support audio, I think. So it's not uh, projecting. Let me see if I can play it later at the end of the show. Uh, but you should listen to this. The, I'll, I'll, I'll try and play it. <clears throat> it's, it's worth listening. And they start by 4 o'clock. And if you are new to that place, you'll start wondering, who is this guy whistling early morning? And it, I sometimes used to get just ladies group uh, to the resort. And they used to complain that there was a guy whistling in the morning they thought that somebody was trying to misbehave with them. It's so humanish. That's why Salim Ali also called it this, the whistling school boy. Anyway, I'll try, I'll try and play it later. And of course, the, uh, the brown fish owls. We have plenty of owls. Uh, this was one of them. Two males trying to contest. <clears throat> trying to contest uh, a female. On the left, going by his beak, I can say this fellow is the young fellow. On the right side, going by his beak, which has turned black, which is a sign of maturity. He must be the old fellow who is trying to protect his wife. And here's a new fellow who is trying to steal his wife. <clears throat> this is a collared scop sowl that was omnipresent in our place. The lorikeet <coughs> or the vernal hanging parakeet, the velvet printed not attach. And the best part was as seasons changed, new birds would come in. At one at one stage, we started seeing this uh, gray headed, gray headed, uh, no, gray fronted green pigeon gray fronted green pigeon. You see the gray on the forehead. Uh, the one on the left, this is the male and this is the female. These are the females. This is the male again. <coughs> and of course, once it's thick set forest, we are bound to have snakes. This is a large scale pit viper. Again, the same large scale pit wiper, the Malabar pit wiper, the hump nosed pit wiper. <coughs> um, by looking at these pictures, you would probably th think that these are large snakes. No, they are all very small snakes. They are that small and highly potent in ve venom. Some say that. These these cannot kill a human, uh, grown up human. Some say they can kill. We don't know. The studies also is varying because some studies says say like you need. <coughs> I think uh, wipers. You need six mm, six uh, mg of lethal dose for a grown up human. But then they proved. It. They also disproved it, saying that if the if the snakes are thinner and smaller, the potent of the venom was higher. So it, you can't fix it and say this much for viper to be fatal. It's the same with cobra. Smaller the cobra, the more potent the venom gets. And speaking of them, there it is. This is virtually my Jeep shed, where I used to park my Jeep. One day, <coughs> I had parked my Jeep outside. And I was in the office, and I heard one, the cleaner, say, Mamba, Mamba. He started shouting. And the naturalist, uh, uh, he said, so they have seen a snake. So we went there. That guy had already gone and picked up a stick and I am in the center. On the left side is this guy with a stick. On the right side is my snake, is the snake. So I had to virtually stop him and he was shocked. He says, no, it's a snake. We have to kill it. I 
I said, no, don't kill it. And I had to like forcefully stop him. I lifted the snake, left it back. He was fuming. He says, what have you done? You have to kill it. I said, no, imagine, imagine a simple logic. This snake, for example, I mean, it's a, it's a grown up snake. So it must have been around at least for one or two years. Now, when you have not seen it for two years and you see it once, suddenly you don't have to, you know, jump at it and say, oh, snake has come off. No, snake has always been there. Just that you didn't see it. And snake has been looking at seeing you. He didn't bother. Why should we bother when the moment we see? So I filled in this logic and uh, he was, he was anyway unconvinced, but then he, he, he just gave up and slowly he forgot about it. But the best part was we kept seeing the snake every now and then guests would report that ah, oh, we saw a big black, a black snake. So we knew it was this cobra. <clears throat> The Indian coral snake, some study says this is non-venomous, some say it is more potent than uh, viper, we don't know, we don't want to know. We know it's a beautiful snake, we photographed it and left it. This is a, uh, I think it's a Pedone's keelback, if there's somebody who wants to defer can, because this is a small one, we don't know what, what snake this is. And very often we would encounter, I think this is a checkered keelback, I might be wrong, but I'm sure it's a keelback. It could also be a Bedome's keelback. Huge, he was virtually from one end of the road to other end. I stopped my jeep, in the jeep, this thing I took my, I took, you can hear the jeep in the background. Yeah. So as he left, I proceeded. <coughs> The forest calotis. Of course, <clears throat> any thick forest would have uh, the Indian chameleon, the chameleon, chameleos I think that's the one we have in India. And the calotis grandis, or the green forest lizard. This is a mobile shot. He was like a pet of our property. You could go and you see this, this is a mobile shot. You could shoot and he would still be there. Then one day I got a call from the property manager and I went and saw he was, she was laying eggs. And let me show you, yeah. Very interesting. She finished laying her eggs and then she would look at it, arrange it and then put mud and tap, tap the mud. She didn't leave it loose. She didn't leave the loose mud, the uh, mud loose. She would tap and tighten the mud. See this? And then <coughs> She would arrange it, then she would just watch. She would pull the mud and close it a little bit. And then she would again go, again push the mud, again arrange it. And then finally when she finished, when she finished, this is how she finished. This is, this is the nest. This is the nest here. She not only put the mud, she even brought leaves and covered it. What a professional job. See that? <coughs> there were a lot of lizards which we kept coming after and I don't remember the name of this, but this lizard had X -ax. it would keep X -ax near its vent and we tried to see there was no X -ax. Uh, sorry not X -ax. what am I saying? Sperm sac. 
So if it's a female, it collects the sperm of the male and keeps it in the egg sac and takes in, takes in as and when food is available and when it's right to, to have uh, babies. Yeah, <clears throat> that's the manager who actually brought me in and he, he, he was also interested in wildlife and photography. So he knew, he saw the potential of Walpare and thought that something more has to be done. And this was one of our frog expedition where we would walk into the flowing water. Frogs, if you, if you talk Walpare, apart from all that I have been speaking now, frogs are another thing. This is, this is water against sky, so it has turned white and they come up and this probably, I don't know if this is a frog or a toad. I think it's, it's a toad. It's a, it might be a toad, it might be a frog. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that. Uh, but there are frogs, bush frogs in, in no less quantity than plenty. And they're not there during the non-breeding season. They are there during breeding season all over the place. And one of the most common frog during the breeding season is this Jairami bush frog. One of the most beautiful frog. They have this um, bubble, they have the air sac which they grow, which they grow big and make noise to attract the female. <clears throat> and uh, you would see them on coffee uh, leaves. Now, apart from this, there are several more bush frogs and they have classified themselves very nicely to see that one frog comes at one time and croaks. And then as the, as the night advances, he stops, some other frog takes over. And then night advances, some other frog takes over. And then they also had uh, uh, altitude variation of uh, living. Some frogs were down, some frogs lived a little up. Mm. This is the Jairami bush frog. Okay, yeah, thank you. Whoever said that, I, before I could read the name, uh, he identified the snake. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, Jarami bush frog, and that's that's from man in the angle. This when we photographed this for whatever reason he was he lifted his body and started croaking. It looked funny from this uh, angle. That's why I took a shot. Yeah, this is the Parmudi uh, bush frog. Another another bush frog that was found in abundance. And this had a different altitude from the Jalani bush frog. And then we have the Vinard bush frog. This is the Anili bush frog, a little rare. We saw this only once. This is the tricolor bush frog. This is the night frog on Nitriback, Nitriback Petrus, something like that. It's called. That's the night frog, the Latin name of the Latin translation of the night frog. I think it's called the Nitribatricus, Nitribatricus. And the speciality of this frog is the moment you handled it, they would roll over and pretend it for some time. And then the moment you leave, they roll over and jump off into the water. The same with the dancing frog. The dancing frog this is not my picture, it's an internet picture. They dance and to attract the female. And these also had the same habit of, if you handle them, they would turn around and play dead. It would look funny. I mean, if you, if you probably see a frog like this, you would think it's dead. But then you're handling it, you know it's alive. Or maybe we are too intelligent for its uh, trick. It was funny. 
this is some unknown frog yet to be identified i've never tried identifying it this used to live in the bark the trees and this is uh, young shoots that have come out from some ficus tree and we saw this uh, eventually it got on the bark and the moment it sits on the bark and gets into the crevices you cannot even see it they just camouflage like that and this is another frog which we couldn't identify if you look at the background it's the hand it used to hop it used to hop so, uh, so we put our hand so that it wouldn't hop and that's when it i took this picture you, you can imagine how small the frog is this is the common indian toad i never knew they they became so beautiful during their uh, breeding stage i mean the toad it's the same frog that we see in our in our gardens we used to see them in abundance when i was young so i i have never seen them i have never seen the male acquire this color this was uh, <clears throat> somewhere deep in, inside a crevices there were so many frogs there and uh, if there was a female the, the frogs would pounce on her so i had to put the mobile down and take a shot but i was scared where where there are frogs there are bound to be snakes so i didn't i didn't i didn't want to try too much because you don't know what would you know pounce on you <clears throat> now this is this is this is bedomi's bush frog which are found a little higher altitude on on the wild uh, uh, in wild prey and uh, this is a video i'll just play this see this is how they call they don't overlap their call they they call and then another another male calls and then this one calls and another male calls and it is said that the calls give away a lot of their capabilities to the female and don't miss its eyes and then among the higher altitude is one of the most beautiful frogs i've seen the travancore bush frog <clears throat> virtually in golden color of course <clears throat> there are plenty of butterflies i just included one butterfly to show that this is th this is a this is an excrete of a lantern macaque and this one is trying to take in some nutrients from the excrete nothing goes waste where well, nothing goes waste in nature these are moths moths were in plenty moths were in plenty all sizes and shapes this is the borer <clears throat> the borer is the ultimate finisher in nature when a tree dies there are lot of things that bring it down like the fungi the bacteria the, uh, the, the, the the birds also dig into it so there are lot of things that bring down the tree slowly and finally it's the borer that reduces the wood uh into powder and mixes it and then it gets mixed into the soil so the dead tree is like a fixed deposit in nature they are the future nutrients of uh the soil generally what happens we in our ignorance we see a dead tree and we remove it no they are the, they are the future nutrients uh of the of the soil and of course the cicada cicada for whatever reasons they have they are they run in odd years that is we have one year cicada three year five year seven year and in us i think we have a 25 year cicada what do i mean by that when for a one year cicada they live underground the cicadas live underground they move about underground they they feed on the sap of the roots they they suck the uh, juice from the roots of the trees and they live and at some particular time when it's when it's matured enough they come out and when they come out 
they mount and they take a beautiful color let me show you this For the whole process it takes about three and a half hours and then it flies off it mates and the uh, and the male dies the female lays eggs uh, <clears throat> and then the cycle again happens and that day next that after uh, this is the same cicada we sh shot in the morning there was this jumping at ant that had come to investigate and that was the first time I was seeing a jumping ant. Jumping ants are venomous uh, ants uh, <clears throat> and the best part about uh, their lifestyle is you know in most of the colony of ants it's the it's the queen and then she she uh, controls all the worker ants. The worker ant has they have to do the uh, the usual chores of bringing food and feeding the young one and when the queen ant dies generally uh, generally the colony dies but here with the jumping ant the moment the queen dies a tournament starts there are several females who start contending for the queen's position the males, of course, they have no play. They just mate and they die. That's it. It's a female. It's a female's world. So they have to contend. At that, to prove themselves, what they do, they actually diminish. They actually shrink their brain up to 20% to save that energy so that their, their production capacity increases. And once the winner is selected, those that were contending will become worker ants again and one takes over as a queen. Very interesting. This is a coffee locust. Suddenly they appear. I don't know from where I, I, have, no, I, have, I have no idea about where they go, but at one point they suddenly appear. They are all over the place. This is coffee seed, and if they are found, they are known as coffee locust. And you have all sorts of caterpillars. This is a caterpillar. Well, there is the caterpillar. It's the body is somewhere inside, and that's that's part of it. This is another caterpillar. And like I said, whatever happens. It happens in abundance in Valpare. Pink termites, one day, I don't know, I mean, we know what triggers, we know that it something triggers for the termites to come out because it was not just one termite nest that spurted out termites, it was all over town, all over the town, across kilometers. One day they just came out in such numbers I've never seen them in such numbers. See that? See that? I've never seen them in this numbers. And uh, next day morning, of course, the macaques were there. Poor video because it's an iPhone video. Don't bother about it. But the macaques were having a feast. This is a diving uh, beetle. <clears throat> As water accumulates, they start a whole lot of new life starts. This is a horse hair worm. You should see this. Just like the humans have a tapeworm, this is a worm 
that's that is found in the cockroach the grasshopper the praying mantis family they are they they they, they get into the body they start eating it and once they become big they rupture the abdomen and they come out they come out they meet then the meat and then uh, the young ones again finds a host and again the uh, repetition happens yeah they also control the bear uh, the brain i must tell you because these need softer wet areas so they make the host go to a water bound area very interesting this is the hammerhead worm one of the most wonder worm one can come across i must tell you first of all its mouth is its anus okay its mouth is its anus so it eats and then excretes from its from one place and then this is a worm that has both testes that's the male organ and the ovaries that's the female organ so it produces eggs and within fertilizes it and lays eggs number 2 number 3 they are neurotoxic they attack worms like earthworm they inject neurotoxin then the toxin gets into the um, earthworm let's say and it sort of uh, you know liquidifies all its organs and then this one sucks in that fluid and then uh, <clears throat> one of the most interesting thing is it's immortal that is when it dies it leaves a part of its tail to the bottom of the leaf and rest of the body falls off and after 2 3 weeks the tail again grows into a bone so it's immortal and then you chop it into pieces each piece regenerates and becomes a worm how good is that that's the <coughs> that's the uh, robber fly of course we all know how they catch they penetrate their proboscis here and sucks in everything and at the end of their suck uh, sucking feeding it's it's amazing to see how they would have finished uh, the entire inner juices of the prey yeah this is just a thing to show that as a professional when i when i photograph i'm doing it i'm i'm creating bio registers for the uh, for the resorts you know it's it's being done on a professional basis for a payment so it becomes important for me to be as professional as possible and generally this is the setup for a macro uh, shoot here here you see the arrow and here you see the subject the camera this is the main light and this is a film light and this is the backlight and that's the picture a bag worm so it's not that i just go with a camera shoot no i i pass that stage decades back today i do a professional job and make it worthwhile for the client another ant which i just photographed because it looked curious and then when when i saw the picture and blew it up i saw that it was actually eating a spider it was It was chewing a spider. It had taken a spider and it was chewing. Uh, I think it is a crane fly. With uh, these are the eggs, a parasitic parasite, where each egg would hatch. They enter the body of the uh, fly. They eat up from inside, and eventually the the the, uh, the crane fly dies. And these by that time they would have. grown up they come out and fly away let me show you a better picture this is another again the same thing a parasite uh, on the spider 
So it's a matter of few days, the spider will be dead because it will be eaten by the parasite. This is an assassin bug again with a parasite. Uh, this is a spider. I think it's a spiny uh, orb. I might be wrong, but here down here, you see the parasites here again. Now this is the picture I want to show you. This down here are the parasites, are the parasites that were inside this. They have finished eating it. Once they finish eating it, they come out and they are pupated. They are pupated. After some time, they are going to come out and fly away, whereas the host is dead with nothing inside. And when the termites come come in, we I showed you the termites. There are every every possible uh, uh, species enjoying the termite. This is a cyclosa. Thrash line spider, the same thrash line spider again. He's eating some moth here, but I like the geometries here. <sighs> if somebody can identify this spider. And this is, I think they do this to feel which way is the wind and which way it can uh, throw its web so that they can get on to the other side. I think this is a Lukachi spider. Beautiful, very colorful. And of course, once we start reducing and come down, we come to the bottom most of the forest, the fungi. These are bracket fungus that grows on a, uh, on a tree. And down there are other types of funguses. And of course, one, one such fungus is the bioluminous fungus, which was found and we photographed it. And it was such a pleasure to see one of our guests find this, uh, find this fungus. The funguses are perhaps the lower most of the life form, but then eventually we have to remember that they are all part of the link of the life chain that is created by nature. And if you look at the link, there is no weak link. All links are equally important in a chain. So, so are the, the fungus which probably grow down there in dirt. We regard them as the lowest form, but they are not. They are, they are equally important in a life chain. So that was all. Thank you so much. <sighs> okay. Hey, excellent session. I, I, I probably seen uh, a few of them several times, but yes, uh, we have a few uh, questions, Raj, to ask this, and uh, I'll, I'll take one by one. So the wide angle uh, shot of that uh, bush frog with uh, with trees in the background. What was it uh, shot with? Which camera and lens? 14 mm, 1424, uh, 1424 lens, probably Nikon 1424, probably a D4 or a D800 body. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 The other one, uh, which lenses, which lens, I, I, uh, in the image that you shot of the bagworm where you showed uh, uh, your uh, setup, I believe that was a 200 mm macro, right? Yeah, that was a 200 mm. Yeah, I showed that was a 200 mm macro. Yeah, yeah it depends on uh, what, if the if the subject is very small, I would prefer the 200 so that in case I have to use rings further to go more than one is to one, I use the power knows it best. <laughs> uh, yeah, otherwise, I use a 60. I just brought a Schneider that will give me four is to one. Let's see what new subjects can be shot. <laughs> But uh, what makes it what makes the picture more interesting is the lighting part. Yeah, do you want to do you want to touch upon the lighting part? Oh, no, 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 that's a subject by itself. Uh, one thing I've seen when I shoot when I shoot birds, most of the birds are very similar forms, correct? 
So there is a similar formula. There is one formula that you can adopt for the birds. But for insects, I've been trying this for, I think you know it, uh, how we've been failing. Because insect, <coughs> one could be round, uh, the best line for micro pictures in the com. There are a lot of uh, questions popping in. Right, right. Going, disappearing before I could read them. No, no, it's okay, Raju. Uh, it's there in the chat. I'll uh, read them for you. Yeah. One by one. So uh, with insects, you know, one could be round, one could be square, one could be longish, one could be rough skinned, one could be smooth skinned, uh, one could be hairy. So there is no formula of lighting that you can adopt with uh, the insects. And because I'm a professional photographer doing ad photography, uh, so I sort of understand the subject and accordingly I light up. I can't give you a formula. Uh, of course, <laughs> that is true. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, laugh it out of you. We've been trying and failing and <laughs> so that, you know, the, the, the basic idea is to formulate, is to have a formula so that when we go uh, doing macro photography, we can carry certain things, but we are unable to uh, give a formula. So we don't know what to carry. Exactly. That's why we are getting stuck. Exactly. So. Yeah, I, I, I could relate to you when you were uh, fumbling to get that perfect recipe kind of an answer. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which result were you mentioning uh, from Revath PC? Uh, I was, when I'm talking of Valpare, I was talking of uh, Brayar, Wood Brayar. It's known as uh, um, T Estate India Limited. Yeah, that's probably the most well-known resort in uh, Valpare. They have about five, six properties. And that's where I was uh, consulting as a naturalist. Right. Uh, Ullas asks, is there a possibility of seeing the galaxy frog in that region? Galaxy frog, I, I, I am not sure. Please repeat. Please repeat. Is there a possibility of seeing the galaxy frog in that region? I don't know if... Galaxy what... frog, I've never heard this. Yeah. Uh, One of the frogs that I have missed, uh, which I we tried, uh, was a purple frog uh, that comes out during one, one particular 10-15 days of the year. Uh, if you miss that, unfortunately, I was in Bangalore at that time and I couldn't go. Okay, it's found in Munar. Okay. Yeah. What is the best lens for uh, macro pitch, micro pictures in Nikon? Your lens, whatever you have is the best lens. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, from which place was the LTM shot at Val Valparai? Where was that uh, lion-tailed macaque shot from? Uh, they have been shot from all over the place, but uh, most of them we were stationed in a place called Pudutotam, so we, that's where we used to do most of our activity. So uh, many of the shots are from Pudutotam, um, but it could be from anywhere else, but around Valpare. So uh, another question from uh, KG Vishal. Sir, I'm a beginner and having 1500D with a kit lens. In Valparai, is it possible to take Leopard with 1500D? It is possible to uh, take Leopards with 1500D because the, the camera does nothing but opening the shutter and registering the thing. What you put in front of it is what matters. Uh, if it is, say, if you are working on uh, torchlight kind of photography, you need, you need a little uh, wider lenses like 2.8 that was shot with the 300 2.8. So another question from uh, Vishal, how to protect ourselves when we are shooting wild animals? Uh, <coughs> uh, you can't wear anything to protect yourself. So uh, there is no such thing as protecting yourself. You have to be, you have to respect and understand the animal. Read about the animal much before you go. Suppose even if it is simple elephant, elephant in X 
region behaves one way, elephant in Y region behaves another way. So you, what you need to do, what you need to read about them is not elephant's temperament. What you need to read is how the elephant behaves when it is annoyed. Number one. Number two, you have to respect them. You have to respect them. They are way too fast, way too powerful. Now I'm not, just not talking of elephants, any animal, way too fast, way too powerful. So we are the weakest, I would say, among the species. So we have to, uh, we have to know them and we have to be at a safe distance. It's called the psychological line. It's called uh, when, when, you in, when you touch the psychological line and the animal starts showing discomfort, uh, starts throwing signs like that, you have to back off. You can't get involved into photography so much that you don't, that you don't forget all this. Right. Um, where can we see hornbills in Valparai? Asks uh, Venkat Maran. Oh, they are there all over. Uh, you can go to the Tata estate. They are very, very much there in Pudukotam. They are there. Uh, they are they're just there all over. But uh, there is a season. You have to go at the right season. Um, I think I would say from October they start suddenly start appearing. Otherwise, they are not there. There is a local a local migration that takes place. By October, they start coming back. Any fruiting tree <coughs> would post uh, on this. By the way, Raju, you can uh, stop sharing. Stop sharing your screen. So there is another question. Arvind Manoj asks, is it possible to do herping? Where? Uh, Valpare. Yes, of course it is possible. Uh, Ashok asks, I am exploring wide angle macro. Any suggestion do you give regarding the light lighting in wide angle and how to approach a subject in wide angle macro as working distance is very narrow, subjects like snakes or frogs? I wouldn't, if, it, if you are shooting venomous snake, respect them, stay away. You have to stay with it. With, uh, you have to stay outside the striking range. You have, if you want to know what is the striking range, just Google through because their striking range is basically how much when they are coiled up, how much they can reach. You have to stay outside that. So I wouldn't suggest a wide angle for venomous snakes at all. Any snake. I mean, even if they are non-venomous, you don't want to have a bite because there could be, you might not, one might not die, but there will be enough complications. Uh, if you are using it on frogs, you have to use external lights. That is, lights outside, not, not on the camera. You have to light them up properly and then approach. Once you light up uh, the subject properly, it doesn't matter which lens you are using, whether you are close to the subject or away, your lighting actually works. Speaks rather. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Raju. One moment. Let me let me see if there are any other questions. Yeah, uh, that's mostly it, Raju. I I have uh, other uh, loads of comments appreciating you, but uh, as for the questions, we are done with them. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for joining and uh, sharing these amazing images and uh, telling your uh, story through with uh, uh, with each of them and uh, uh, imparting your knowledge. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Pawan, for having me in and all the uh, your organization that's organizing this show. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Wildlife Focus Team. Thank you, Raju. Good evening. Bye bye. Good night.